All right, good morning, everybody. Good morning. My name is Eddie. I'm a part time pastor here at Harvest LA, and really happy to share this morning's message. And I'm going to explain why we're actually doing it, but uh, let me pray first, okay? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to share the message uh, with my brothers and sisters. And just thank you for all the new visitors. So happy that they can join us today. And just pray that they'll feel blessed, and everyone here as well, that your word will go out. Um, and uh, yeah, thank you, Lord. Pray just Amen. Amen. All right, let me explain. Let me explain. Okay. Um, I'm really not going to preach about Jaws 2. I put that there because this will be actually part two of the sermon. Uh, the, actually, I will try to finish the sermon I started the last time I preached, which was about Jaws. Okay. And let me explain. Let me explain what happened. Um, so we had a mission sharing at the very beginning, uh, the last time I preached, preached. And that was amazing. So important. I'm so glad you guys shared. And, uh, and then when it was time for me to preach, I didn't realize, I got so caught up in, in the message of Jaws. And I did a lot of research, and there was a lot of really interesting stories. And so I got so caught up in all the stories, and that I was talking about Jaws, the movie, that when it was time for me to start preaching the Bible, I looked up at the time, and it was time to end. So at that point, I just kind of like ran through the Bible, just a few of the Bible passages really quickly, and, and just ended it. And, and later on, actually, Jed rebuked me for not preaching God's Word, <laughs> for like talking about the movie Jaws like the whole time. And so that's why I feel like, you know what? I, what I need to do this time is to finish the message that I started last time. So it will be mainly about the Bible and not so much about Jaws. And really, okay. But I'll still talk just a little bit about it, just to, just to, for those who weren't here last time, so you guys will know what the background um, is that I'm, what I'm talking about. All right. So last time I talked about Jaws, I talked about how. This is, who is this? Steven Spielberg. How this was a huge phenomenon when it came out uh, in the mid 70s, and also how this was the very first movie that I ever saw when I was five years old. My mom took me to see Jaws in Taiwan. I don't know what she was thinking when she took me <laughs> to see Jaws. And I still remember it. I still remember watching the movie Jaws. And maybe I'm thinking that's one of the reasons why I'm not so scared of scary movies or ghosts or monsters because I've already I was already desensitized <laughs> to Jaws so now I'm like oh, ghosts goblins zombies whatever I saw Jaws when I was five years old it was no big deal right so so this was the movie in uh, 1975 and I talked about how it was a huge blockbuster when it came out it was the highest grossing film until Star Wars two years later and it won Oscar for Best Original Score. Uh, it won Best Sound, Best Film Editing. It was nominated for Best Picture that year, but it didn't win because there's a lot of other good films that, that summer or that, uh, that year. And how the shark, the mechanical shark they're using to film the movie broke down all the time so that in the movie you actually don't see the shark very often. You only see the, the yellow barrels you know, in the water. Because the reason why they did that was because the shark broke down, and so it kind of uh, actually made the movie even scarier because you don't see the, the monster very often. And I talked about some different Jaws rides, because Universal owns uh, Jaws, the rights to Jaws. So Universal Studios Hollywood, we've all been there, a lot of us have been there. We see the Jaws thing in the lake, but then in Universal uh, Studios, Florida and Universal Studios, Osaka, Japan, they actually have a Jaws ride uh, that you're in a boat. It's kind of like Disney's Jungle Cruise. You go through the Jaws ride, and then the, you have the mechanical sharks swimming around and attacking the boat and stuff. And I talked about some, some um, lawsuits associated with this ride, and I got lost with lawsuits. Sorry. Uh, I am a lawyer, so just like Dr. Scott talks about medical stuff, uh, when he preaches, I talk about legal stuff. You know, I'm just interested in that kind of stuff. Um, so this movie, it talks about how there is this this uh, uh, fictional island called Ebony Island, and in the summers they have a lot of people coming over 
from outside of the, the area, tourists to come to spend the summers on Amity Island. And this is the setting for the movie Jaws and where this big giant great white shark begins to attack people. And I talked about how the three main characters in the movie are not superstars, superheroes, super strong people. These are very flawed uh, individuals. Regular Chameaux, average Joes, they're not, you know, this is not Arnold Schwarzenegger, this is not Robocop, this is Roy Schneider playing a police chief. The name is Brody. He is uh, a New York cop who kind of semi-retires onto this island. And he's trying to live a nice, quiet, peaceful life. And because he's from New York, he's not, not used to being in the ocean and being on boats at all. Um, and then we have here an oceanographer. His name is Hooper, played by Richard Dreyfuss. And he is used to the water. He's used to the ocean. He's an oceanographer. But at the same time, he comes from a rich family. If you watch the movie, his background is he comes from a rich family, which is why he can afford to become an oceanographer and have all this expensive gear. And so, you know, in the movie, it, it tells how he's never worked a hard day in his life. He's kind of a kind of a girly guy, you know, not very strong, not very macho. And we have Shark Hunter Quint, played by Robert Shaw. He was the captain of the fishing boat. And he himself as well, even though he is a seasoned veteran shark hunter, but he has these deep emotional scars from when he was uh, back in the Navy during the younger days, how his ship was torpedoed and how the ship sank and how he and most of the crew were floating around in the Pacific Ocean for days, slowly getting picked off by sharks. And there's some very dramatic scenes of him describing how how people were being, all around him, were being eaten by sharks as they were floating around the water for days on end. So these three guys, very flawed. At the beginning of the movie, they really couldn't stand each other. They didn't like each other at all. They disagreed, they fought, they dis did not respect each other. But as the movement progressed, as they were on the boat, going through their adventure, trying to kill the shark, they began to bond and they formed a friendship with one another. And eventually, the three of them were able to take out the shark. Um, even though one of them died, the, the captain Quint ended up getting eaten by the shark. The whole, the, the whole half minute of screaming and uh, blood coming out of his mouth. Um, but in the end, uh, they were able to, to take out the shark. And one of the points that I talked about last time I spoke was that you know, we talk about the movie Jaws, it's a fictional character, a uh, fictional monster, but I also talked about how, as Christians, we live in the world where there is a reality of something that is just like Jaws, and, and this monster is Satan, and he's real, and how he is an angel, a very powerful spiritual being, but he has turned to the dark side, so to speak. And, and legions of his angels have also turned to the dark side and have become adversaries of God and adversaries of God's people, meaning us. And 1 Peter 5, 6 to 10 talks about Satan, um, talks about, this is the Apostle Peter speaking to us, the church, he says, be alert and sober of mind your enemy. The devil prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour, like a roaring lion, or it could be like a shark, a cruising shark. Always, always looking for someone to devour. But we don't need to be afraid, right? We don't need to be afraid of Satan, even though he is very powerful, he is really smart, and he's looking to kill us, okay? Everyone who is God's people, he is our adversary. But for those of us who, who believe in God, who trust God, who are God's children. Uh, 1 John 4 says, Dear children, you are from God and you have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So who is the one that is in the world? Satan. Satan is in the world. And who is the one that is in you? God's children. Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is in us. And so because of that, we have nothing to fear. We need to take Satan seriously. We need to be be sober, we need to be alert, but at the same time, we don't have to be afraid, because we have the Holy Spirit inside of us. So, that has to do with Jaws. Also talk 
about briefly about 2 Corinthians chapter 12. How you don't have to be super to be a hero. And for 2 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to talk about uh, these passages a lot more um, today. But uh, this is the Apostle Paul speaking to the Christians in Corinth. And he's talking about his own weakness. The Apostle Paul, he's right there, the guy, he's in chains. He's writing to the Corinthian church. And he is saying that, hey, I am not some superhero, okay? I am actually really weak. I'm a very weak person. And because I'm weak, God's power rests in me. Because I am weak, I am strong. Because of the power of Christ that is in me. That is what he's talking about. And I'll mention that this summer, one of the biggest movie, the one that just became the highest grossing film in the history of film, is Avengers um, uh, Endgame, right? Avengers Endgame. You have the highest grossing movie of all time, and you have all these superheroes, and that's what we like. As a, we like people who are super, we like people with, who are special, they have all these powers, they can do this and that, they're... They're stronger, greater than normal people, and we like that, right? We really like watching that. But the reality of real life is that God uses, God does not use superheroes. God uses regular schmoes, like the Apostle Paul, like these three guys, right? I, that's why I really like the movie Jaws, because the, the main protagonists are just three people with a lot of weaknesses and a lot of flaws and yet they're able to work together to kill this monster. And, um, and that's what the Apostle Paul is talking about in terms of himself. And he even says, he even uses super apostles. Right? He says, 2 Corinthians 11, do not think I am in the least inferior to those super apostles. What was happening at that time? Who was he talking about? The Apostle Paul was talking about certain Christian leaders during that first century church period where they went around saying, hey, I'm a super apostle. Look at me. I'm so great. You should follow me. All right? You love Jesus? Follow me because I'm a super apostle. So that's what they're talking about themselves. And uh, they were doing things not for the sake of God's kingdom but to, for their sake of their own interests. All right? They're very charismatic. You know, great speakers, have a lot of people following after they're good looking, or I don't know what it is that makes them so attractive, but they were super apostles. And the apostle Paul is saying, hey, you know, I'm weak. But guess what? Don't think I'm inferior to these super apostles. Right? I may indeed be untrained as a speaker, but I do have knowledge and have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. He has knowledge from God. He has a special super knowledge, supernatural knowledge from God and the Holy Spirit. Even though he may not be as elegant or as uh, refined or as charismatic as some of these other super apostles. So, uh, from the movie Jaws, I was gonna talk about this last time, but I just kinda skipped over it because I didn't have time. So this is why I'm gonna focus on this. I'm gonna talk about leaders today. I'm gonna focus on leaders. In the movie Jaws, there was a leader. The main leader, in the movie Jaws is Mayor Vaughn. He's the mayor of the island of Amity. And he's a very charismatic leader. People love him and people follow him. He goes to the city council meter meetings and people are just listening to him and, and just like doing what, what he wants. And you know, reporters are coming after him and stuff. But throughout the whole movie, what we see is that Mayor Vaughn does not really have the interests of the citizens of Amityville at mind, in his mind. He only has his own interests at heart. And so through the whole movie, you see him downplaying, like especially at the beginning of the movie, he's downplaying the, the danger of the shark that's swimming in the water. Why is he doing that? Because he doesn't want to scare anybody away. He wants people to come. You know, his supporters are the business leaders of the island of Amity. So he needs these people to come in order to spend money and make these business people happy so they could, you know, make money during the summer because that's where they get most of their income during the summertime. So he, he's saying, oh, there's no problem. We don't have a shark problems. Keep these beaches open. 
And there's this one scene which, which, like in the middle of the movie, where everyone's on the beach, and everyone thinks, I think there's a shark in the water, so people are kind of scared. Nobody wants to go in the water. People are just kind of like sitting at the beaches and kind of looking around, there's nobody in the water. And Mayor Bond is like, hey, get in the water. Joe, get in the water, come on, get in the water, get in the water. Trying to get people to get in the water, and eventually, people slowly start to get into the water. They're kind of scared, but little bit by little get in the water. They see a few more people get in the water, so they kind of get in the water, and pretty soon more and more people get in the water, and pretty soon everyone gets in the water, and then what happens? Shark attacks, right? And so, Mayor Vaughn is one of those leaders. Those, he is, I would say, an anti-hero, one of the anti-heroes in the movie. He's supposed to be looking out for the interests and the safety of the people that he's leading. But we can see that actually, he does not have their interest in mind. He's thinking about his own interests. And so he's a leader that people actually shouldn't be following. And there's a couple of memes that uh, I found out. His, his jacket, his anchor jacket, actually became a meme. Um, Mayor of Lairvon's keeps beaches, beach open to miss shark attacks that kills locals and tourists. Four years later, still married, and still, still mayor. Um, oh yeah, Jaws 2, he's still mayor. So people are like, how does he still be mayor? You know, what, what's going on with this guy? Well, how, how, does he, how does he still be mayor in, in um, Jaws 2? And that face when the mayor may, that there may be another shark problem. You can actually buy his jacket. His jacket, his jacket actually has a Twitter account. It has a Facebook. <laughs> You know, it's really funny. You should, you should look it up. You know, it's, it's just for, you can actually buy his jacket. People sell, make and sell that anchor jacket online because it's so, it's so iconic now. So, all right, what about the Bible? What about Christianity? What about the first century church? Well, the Apostle Paul also warns the Christians about this type of leader, just like Mary Vaughan. The Apostle Paul He's speaking to the Christians in Corinth, and he says, I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from those, from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. For such people are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then that his servants also masquerade as servants of unrighteousness. Their end will be what their actions deserve. So, what is the, his main point? His main point is don't blindly follow leaders. And that's the main point I wanted to share with you guys today. Don't blindly follow leaders, whoever they may be whether they're religious leaders, or political leaders, or business leaders, whoever they may be, don't just follow, blindly follow people. Because not everyone is looking out for your best interests, or the, even the interests of God. And this includes churches, right? This includes churches. You know, I, I am a, I'm a, again, I'm a lawyer, so I'm gonna, I, I like legal stuff. So a couple of cases just to share with you, okay? This is high profile cases. This is not, this is not um, you know, confidential because they're not my clients, okay? So and this is high profile, right? You, you have these, there's a case of pastors defrauding the church. That happens all the time, all the time. You know, an example would be one of these really older traditional churches that are kind of dying. You know, they have the really nice, expensive building, but maybe they have 10 members, and they're all grandmas, because they like their traditional services, right? And so like young people, they don't go to churches like that. And so you have these grandmas there, and they can't really afford to pay a pastor, so they don't have a pastor, um, but they do have a huge building that's worth a lot of money. And so here comes this young pastor, and he comes over, and he's like, hey guys, you know, Hire me as your pastor. And I know you don't have any money in your bank account, but I'll do it for free. Don't, you don't have to pay me. Just, just do, I'll do it for free. And they're like, wow, 
this pastor, he's, able, he's willing to come and be our pastor for free. Yeah, come on over. And so he comes over and he preaches and he visits these grandmas and makes them feel like cared for, you know, and he's really charismatic. And pretty soon he goes, hey, you know, why don't we start a new ministry? You know, we can start this new ministry. We can sell this building that we that we own and and start this new ministry over here. Use the money to start this new ministry and bring more life into the congregation. And these grandmas are like, oh, yeah, this sounds like a great idea. We love this young pastor. He's our pastor. He's so awesome. Yeah, let's do what he says. And so they sell the building. So they, this building is like worth $5 million, right? So they, now they have $5 million. And so, and so this pastor says, hey, you know what? No, we have some money in the accounts now. What about starting to pay me a salary? And they're like, yeah, you know, a worker deserves his wages. We should start paying this, this, this pastor a salary. So, okay, how much should we pay him? Oh, $100,000? Okay, that sounds good. $100,000, one year, two years, three years, four years, five years. Pretty soon, all the money is in the pastor's pocket. And then he resigns, runs off of the money. Right? True story. True story. It happens. It happens all the time. Right? So just because somebody's a pastor does not mean you should just blindly follow. You know, I'm not talking about high-profile cases. I'm, I'm sure you guys all know, see all the high-profile cases, you know, on the news all the time, right? Pastors, elders, deacons, Sunday school teachers, whoever it is, right, commit all kinds of um, wrongdoings in the name of Christ. So don't just follow people. Don't just follow people blindly. Right? Say to themselves, there are false apostles, these deep workers masquerading as apostles of Christ, even to this day. Last, this past Monday, I went to a church safety seminar. And so, it was mostly about uh, first person, it's about mass shootings, right? We had a lot of mass shootings. So, it was a conference for church leaders to deal with church safety. One of the topics was mass shootings. But they also talked about uh, child safety. They talked about child safety. And when I went there and I listened to them talk about child safety, I, I'd say that I felt pretty good. Because I looked at what our church is doing, and we're pretty much doing like everything. Everything that they're, that they're saying, how churches, what churches should be doing to protect children. And so I felt pretty good. I mean, sure, there's a few things that I learned that we could do more, a little bit more, to make our church. We, need, we don't want churches to become a fortress. Okay, That's not what we want. But at the same time, we have a responsibility to protect our children. So we want ch churches to become hardened targets so that when a predator comes along looking for a target, and they'll visit churches and they'll look around and they'll see you know, what churches are, are easy targets. They'll come to our church and go, okay, this is a hardened target and now I'm going to opt out. This is the term that they use for people who are like, no, this is not, this is not a place where I can prey on children, so I'm going to opt out. Okay, that's what we want to be. One of those. Unfortunately, they'll go on to a softer target, right? But we do not want to be one of those soft targets here at our church. Child safety is very important. But in any case, for you guys, for the kids, all right, for the kids, if ever an adult makes you feel uncomfortable. This happens all the time in churches. If ever an adult makes you feel uncomfortable, whenever an adult makes you feel like you're special, okay, right? And you feel uncomfortable about it, and begins to express romantic gestures towards you, okay? Happens all the time, guys. I know you guys are laughing about this, but it happens all the time. I'm a lawyer, I see the cases. I see it. I see people. I see churches destroyed because of this kind of stuff. Okay. All right. You have to tell somebody. That person does not care about you. That person is not your friend. You have to tell somebody. There are false apostles, deceitful workers, masquerading as apostles of Christ. Okay. Those are real, even to this day. All right. Acts 17. Oh, okay, this is the Apostle Paul also saying, don't blindly follow me. 
right? I'm the Apostle Paul. Don't just blindly follow me. This is what he says. This is the Apostle Paul talking uh, in the book of Acts. He talks about the, the Christians in Berea, right? For they received the message, his message, with great eagerness and examined the scriptures every day to see if what Paul said was true. Even the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul says, hey guys, don't just take what I say for face value. Look in the Bible for yourself. Look in the Bible and check to see if what I say is true. And do this not just for me, but for every religious leader that teaches you. Don't just take anything for face value. Always read the Bible. Always check for yourself to see if it is true. And verse 12, as a result, many of them believe as did a number of prominent Greek women and many Greek men. The Bereans. Okay. First Corinthians chapter 3. We're still in Corinthians. This is the Apostle Paul talking to the church in Corinth at that time. The church was pretty big. A lot of different leaders. A lot of uh, uh, members within the church in Corinth. And the Apostle Paul is saying, don't put leaders on a pedestal. And what is going on in that church is that there was jealousy and there was quarreling among the church. Jealousy and quarreling within the church. There's a lot of church leaders, a lot of people, and some people are saying, hey, you know, Paul, Paul, he is my advisor. I follow Paul. Paul is my, my pastor. I follow Paul. Some people are saying, no, Apollos, he's much better. He's my advisor. He's the one that I follow. He preaches a lot better. We know that Apollo uh, was a much was a very good speaker. Right? In Acts 18, he is fervent in the spirit. He spoke and taught accurately the things concerning Jesus. So he was a much better speaker than Paul. How do we know Paul was not such a good speaker? Besides the the, the passage that I just talked about, how uh, he was not a trained speaker. How do we know he's not as good of a speaker? Any idea? Somebody died because of his preaching? <laughs> you remember that? Who died because of his preaching? So there was some guy sitting on a window. Yeah. Some guy was sitting on a window. The apostle was preaching. And the guy was like listening. And he was like, he starts nodding up. And he falls backward outside of the window, and then he falls down like three stories or something, and then he dies, right? And then the Apostle Paul had to like, oh no! He had to run over, and then run down, and then like he heal him and raise him from the dead, right? <laughs> you, guys know, you guys don't know the story? You guys know the story? This is in the Bible. This is in the Bible, okay? The Apostle Paul killed somebody because his sermon was so boring, but then he was able to raise them back to life. This is real. This is in the Bible. In any case, in any case, the Apostle Paul is saying, what are you guys doing? Why are you guys elevating these leaders up, even myself up to the point of saying, oh, this leader's better. That leader's not as good. Oh, I follow this leader. No, this, I don't follow this leader. I'm part of this group. You're part of that group. Quarreling and jealousy. The Apostle is saying, no. These guys are just, we are just God's servants. Right? Verse 6, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God has been making it grow. So neither the one who plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The one who plants and the one who waters have one purpose, and they will each be rewarded according to their own labor. For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. Right? It's a team. We are co-workers in God's service. We are a team. Even though I'm sad to say, Christian leaders, a lot of times, do not act like they're on the same team. And that's a reality. That's a reality. I've been in ministry for a, lot, a long time. And I've seen so more often than, than not Christian leaders who are in it for their own kingdom rather than for the kingdom of God. Christian leaders who put their own interests over the interests of the people they're leading or the interests of God's kingdom. 
the Apostle Paul saying, no man, that's not, that's not how we should be. This is not your sheep, my sheep. This is our sheep. You know, this is not you versus me. This is not, I want to be the senior pastor. No, I want to be the senior pastor. No. We're on the same side. There's no competition. But unfortunately, there often is. Right? And that should not be even to this day. I know, I know of a church. Uh, my wife is a seminary professor, and so she hears even more stories than me. Right? She's, she, she knows of a church, an Asian church, I'm not going to say what type of Asian, uh, where it's quite big, quite a large mega, Asian mega church, uh, and they have like 10 pastors, and none of them are friends. They hate each other. Why? Because they're competitors. They're all gunning for the senior pastor position. That's what they're doing. That's what they want. Right? Unfortunately, that's what we have in this day. But it shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. We are co-workers. First Corinthians 3. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care. For no one can lay out any foundation than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their will will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is built up, if it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, yet will be saved, even though as one escaping through the flames. This is these are talking about Christian leaders, Christian leaders in the church, right? Everything we build, we're trying to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. Everything that we do, whatever, whatever a pastor, an elder, whoever, or a Christian leader, whatever we're trying to do for the church, we're trying to build on the foundation of Jesus Christ. But sometimes, some people use gold, some people use silver, fossil stones, yet other people use wood, hay, or straw. What is the difference? Some are precious, and yet some others are not. Some people use uh, materials that build their own career. Or some use materials that build up their own reputation or status. Some use materials that build up their own financial gain, or maybe relationships, social, their social circles. And those are the wood, hair, straw, and these things will be burned through the fire. You're not, you're going to be saved, right? You're going to escape through the flames. But whatever you are using to build, if it's not in God's interest, if it's not for God's kingdom, it will not survive. First Corinthians 3, 16. Okay, this is, this is very serious now. This, is, this kind of makes me shiver, okay, a little bit. So it says... Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. What is he, who is he talking about? He's talking about Christian leaders who tear up the church. That's what he's talking about. It's very serious. Because God will destroy that person. Right? People who sow dissent and jealousy and quarreling and try to divide up the church. Now there are times, there are valid times where church needs to break up and go their separate ways. Right? The, uh, um, Martin Luther, he broke up the church, the Reformation. Right? He broke up the Catholic Church and started the Protestant Reformation. There are times where there are very valid reasons why, where churches should break up and go their separate ways. Very few, but very few are legitimate reasons. Very few have serious disagreements, theological, doctrinal reasons to break up the church and go their own way. But I see more often that churches break up because of small, petty reasons, like worship style, or church culture. Churches break up 
because of those reasons. And it just, it just makes me shudder. It makes me shudder. Because God will destroy that person. They're serious. They're serious. And I have to say, I, I've seen it. I've seen it. God may not physically destroy this person. He's not, he may, this person may, or persons may not be struck by lightning, but I've seen churches break off because of these petty reasons, and they go off, and they eventually die. Because God does not bless those type of ministries. And they shrivel up, and they close down, and they dissolve. Disillusion. I, I you know, this type of lawyers have to do get involved with the church that dissolves. What happens? So verse 18, do not deceive yourselves. If any of you think you are wise by the standards of this age, you should become fools so that you may become wise. So about verse 18, uh, I'm going to be really honest with you and share with you that my biggest struggle, my biggest personal struggle with sin is probably in this area. I think you're wise by the standards of this age. I'll, I'll share, I'll confess, I'll confess to you. Some of you, a few of you may know this, some of you may not know this about me, but my biggest struggle is pride. That's my biggest struggle. Because I do know quite a lot of stuff, right? I do, I, I do know a lot of stuff about church, I do know a lot of stuff about law, I do just know a lot of stuff, a lot of experience and this and that. And inside, I struggle with thinking that I know better than anybody else. And from time to time, God has to humble me. God has to humble me to make me realize, hey, I'm not all that, you know, wise by the standard of this age, right? Just a month ago, just a month ago, I was taking Caleb and Deborah home. <laughs> Actually, it's not funny. I almost killed somebody. I was taking them home, and I was driving on, what was it? Is it Main Street? Valley. I was driving on Valley. I was going to make a left turn on, on Charlotte, and I was like, I wasn't distracted, okay? I was not distracted. The music was not on. I wasn't texting, you know? We weren't even talking. You guys were sitting there, and I'm just sitting there, and I'm just driving, and I'm making a left turn, and all of a sudden, I hear Caleb and Deborah go, there's a person, there's a person! And then I slam on the brake. Just, I, the car just literally screeched to a stop, and this woman on a bike just like was right in front of me, like, like, like went by like that. I was like. <laughs> and I, was, I was literally shaking. It's like, I almost killed somebody, you know? If it wasn't for, for them in the car saying, there's a person, there's a person, it would have been, my life would have changed. And that person's life would be even more changed. <laughs> that was an understatement. That was quite an understatement. <laughs> any case, any case. That was a very humbling experience for me. And from time to time, God has to do that to me, okay? So this is what I want to ask for you guys, okay? If you guys ever see me thinking that I am wise by the standards of this age, I want you guys to warn me, just like Deborah and Caleb, okay? Pastor Eddie, there's a person, there's a person, or just, Pastor Eddie, look out. Okay, please warn me. Please warn me. All right? Okay. All right, so, oh, so then no more boasting. Oh, no more boasting about human leaders. No more boasting about human leaders. You're of Christ, and Christ is of you. Okay, all right, just as we end, I wanted to bring up two things that just happened a couple weeks ago. A couple weeks ago, after the sermon that, that I, after that I didn't finish the sermon, this happened, okay? Joshua Harris, Joshua Harris. Uh, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Joshua Harris. Raise your hand if you're familiar, okay. So, couple, 10 years ago, more than, Oh, 20, 20 years ago, he wrote, as a 23-year-old, he wrote this book, I Kiss Dating Goodbye. So 1.2 million copies worldwide. We, as a church, that time I was a full-time pastor in charge of the student ministry. 
We all went through this book. The whole student ministry went through this book. Do you remember that? Did you do it? Where were you there? You know, there. Were you there? You guys remember? I remember we talked about it. We talked about it, right? <laughs> maybe, maybe a few, some ministries went through this book, some ministries talked about it. But basically, in this book, he talked about um, I, kiss, I kiss dating goodbye, and the premise is we don't just date casually. There's no, you know, Christians should not casually date. You know, you should be like, if you, you should be courting me. You know, if you should be more serious about looking forward to a marriage, you don't just date for fun. So that was, that was the main point of the book, okay? And so we went through that. 1997, 2015, he became a pastor at Covenant Life Church in Maryland. He became lead pastor in 2004. 1999 to 2011, he led and organized the Passion and Next Conferences. You guys went to those, right? I remember you guys went to some of those. Passion and Next Conferences. People are raising their hands, worshiping God, you know, hallelujah, People, everyone gets hyped up. And then July 2019, he announces just last month, okay, less than a month ago, he announced he was separating from his wife and that he no longer considers himself a Christian. How does that happen? How does that happen? And then a week later, what happens? Marty Thompson. Marty Sampson, I mean. Marty Sampson. Not Thompson. Marty Sampson. How many of you have heard of Mark, yeah, the worship leaders, right? You guys know Marty Sampson. Late 1990s. He was with Hillsong Church in Australia the last 20 years producing worship music for Hillsong music groups, including Hillsong United, Hillsong Worship, Hillsong Young and Free. Uh, performed with a lot of different Hillsong legends. Very popular songs. We sing the songs. I don't think we sang anything recently. We haven't sung anything of this recently. But we, at some point, we sang a lot of his songs. Um, and then in August, this month, earlier this month, he posted on Instagram, I am genuinely losing my faith. Whoa. Whoa. These two huge celebrity Christian leaders losing their faith. And afterwards, I, I hear about a lot of people, you know, a lot of people's faiths were really shaken by this. Like their own faiths were shaken because of their two heroes, their two Christian heroes, huge influential people in their lives have now basically said, I'm not a Christian anymore, or I don't know I'm a Christian anymore. Okay? So this is the main takeaway. Okay? I'm not here to, by the way, I'm not here to judge them. I'm not here to condemn them. I don't know what's going on in their life or what happened in their life to cause them to be at this point in their life to say that I'm no longer a Christian. I don't know. I, I hope and I pray that one that this will be a process that God will bring them through, that in the end they will come back, come out to be stronger Christians than ever. That is my hope and that is my prayer. But at the same time, the reason why I bring this, these two people up at the end of the message I just shared with you is, again, to emphasize this. The foundation of our faith is in Jesus Christ and not in any fallible human leader. Right? Jesus Christ is our foundation. Read the Bible for yourself. Don't just take whatever a Christian leader tells you at face value. Don't just blindly follow people without thinking for yourself. Is this really something that God wants me to do? Is this really God's will for me in my life? All right. Uh, what should we uh, What should we want to come up? Let's, um, let's uh, prepare for offering. And the ushers come forward.